Hello, I'm Mr. Joe and welcome to my podcast. You may know me. I'm a coach to CEOs of um, startups, progress companies and large enterprises. And today I'm really excited to be chatting to Alison Coward. Hi, Alison. Do you want to give yourself an introduction? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, so my name is Alison Coward. I am the founder of a team culture consultancy called Bracket. Um, the way that I describe Bracket is that we work with forward thinking organizations to help them build high performing team cultures. And we sort of take workshops and um, programs and training all around helping teams work better together. Personally, I'm an author. Um, I speak at conferences from time to time um, and yeah, facilitation, coaching, all of those nice things. Great. And you've got a book out, haven't you, at the moment called Workshop Culture. That's your new book, right? So we it want to talk about workshops today because I think I want to, we can sort of dispel some myths about workshops, especially at that kind of C-suite level where they're often seen as being, well, just, you know, a little bit, a bit shit really, you know, at that level, it's like, you know, less, yeah. people in a conference room somewhere all chatting with, with a whiteboard. There's no sort of, you know, there's nothing, no life to it. Do I mean, do workshops have to be at that level? Do they have to be bad? I mean, what does a good workshop at that sort of discreet level look like? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the main reasons that workshops don't work, I mean, there's lots of reasons why they don't work, but I would say that if they don't, if they're not working at that level, it's because people have uh, the wrong perception of, of what a workshop is. A workshop isn't just about getting everyone in a room and having some post-it notes on the whiteboard and like everyone speaking and, you know, it being a little bit less or be actually completely unstructured conversation, which might be the opposite of what you might think of a, a formal meeting. Um, a workshop is a space where you do need to design that process. You do need to be really specific. You need to know, um, you know, what you want to achieve, um, who are the right people to be in that room what are the questions and areas that you want to explore together? And, you know, what's the final result that you're looking for? And then you need to think about all of the different dynamics that might happen in that workshop and design, design for that. Um, so, yeah, I think when workshops don't work is when people have this misconception that it's just about, like, let's all get into a room together and have a... Let's kind of it out. Fun, yeah. creative blue sky. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, it's interesting because I've just recently um, written an article about off-sites, um, which are obviously, you know, very um, popular within mm. the kind of management calendar, strategic planning calendar. And I think... Recently, they've been democratized a lot more, probably because of remote working and the need to get teams together at various times throughout the year to, you know, spend time together. But historically, they have been, offsites have been this um, format for management teams to get together and talk about the future of the organization. And the first article that I came across around um, offsites was, I think, from, oh gosh, I think it was 2006. Um, it's an article in Harvard Business Business Review called um, "Offsites That Work." So even then, this idea of these kind of collaborative conversations, people could see the value of them, but they weren't working in terms of you know how much it it costs to take people out of the office, get people together in an expensive location perhaps hiring a facilitator. Um, so yeah, so this idea of, you know, getting people together, probably the most expensive people in the organization at an expensive location for a length of time, which obviously costs the company. And yet these conversations weren't not only, you know, you might have had a good time in those sessions and it might have felt productive, but they weren't leading to anything in the business. They weren't leading to any change. Um, and so this article, Offsites at Work, was about how to, you know, not only have a productive discussion, but also make sure that they have that like, real value um, for the company. And I think when people have repeated experiences like that, where um, it's either the day itself wasn't useful or the day may have been useful, it might have felt like fun, but then there was no results afterwards. Doing that time mm. and time again, it gives workshops a bit of a bad name. Well, there's always this hope, isn't it? Like we'll just, we'll get everybody in a room and then fingers crossed the magic will happen, right? But it's right. like what you're saying is that they need, you know, you need objectives. You need to know what you're working towards in these as well and some sort of structure, you know, because you, you mentioned there as well that there's the opposite side of this, which are meetings where, you know, it's death by PowerPoint, which is the opposite where there's no sort of real collaboration going on. 
And it seems that people fall to one side or another, right? Where there's far too much structure, reams of PowerPoint, or no structure at all, a vague hope that something's mm. going to come from it. And you kind of need that middle ground, don't you? Where you need to set objectives and sort of design that day. And I like the way you talked about designing it. So if you were going to design like an offsite for a C-suite team, what kind of, talk us through how you would go about doing something like that. Yeah, you know, I mean, what just popped into my head is that think about your offsite as a mini project that you're going to be working on together. And, you know, for anything that you're doing, you're going to sit down and you'll think, right, okay, what is the reason, i.e. what is the purpose of this? Um, think about um, purpose, the outcomes. Um, I always recommend thinking or fast forwarding to um, the end of the offsite or even beyond the end of the offsite. So imagine that this offsite has gone in the way that you intended. We'd had a brilliant conversation. We'd got the results that we wanted. What would be happening in the business as a result? and then work backwards from there. So think about the outcomes, think about things that you need to produce as a result of your time together. Um, and then start thinking about today, who's going to be in the room. Um, I have a process, which is literally that purpose and outcomes outputs, and then brainstorming all of the questions that you need to explore together. And the reason you need to start from questions is because you want to avoid that death by PowerPoint. If people are just coming along and it's about each person presenting their point of view, um, they have an agenda, they want to get their point across, that's not the environment for a productive discussion. Actually, you want to go from the perspective that um, we are starting from scratch together and we've got all these things that we want to discuss and we're going to be creating value together. The value hasn't been created yet. We are going to be using this time to create value together, develop new ideas, solve problems. And so once you've identified all of those different areas, that's when you've got almost like the, um, the sections or the themes that you will want to discuss and cover in your offsite, all the things that you need to do, what you want to achieve. And that's when you can start planning your structure out. Okay, what makes sense for us to address in what order? Um, you know, there might be an element of looking back. I mean, I'm actually just writing a, um, a newsletter about a big picture thinking template that I love wow. um, teams yeah. to do that. Looking back, um, you know, what did we want to achieve? Did we achieve it? Looking at um, outside influences, what's our competition doing? Um, what's happening in the industry? What trends are we seeing? And then starting to ideate about the future and think, okay, what do we want to do in the future? What resources do we have? What resources are we missing? Um, what is our ideal state? All of those kinds of things. And um, But that has to be structured. Those, those questions, you have to create a structure, not only as to what the questions are you want to answer, but how you're going to discuss those questions together. Because there are different formats that you can use and you can do, you know, some individual thinking. You can have breakout groups. You can have um, teams kind of, you know, doing problem solving sessions together where they present. But you can, there's lots of different tools and techniques that you can use to manage those conversations that will come right at the end. But once you've figured out, okay, what is it that we are going to get together and talk about? I love that. I love the way you talk about asking and posing questions as well, because that then shifts the energy, doesn't it? Because Often what you see is people talk about wanting vague things like alignment or, you know, downloading information. It can end up, again, being that death by PowerPoint where you're just giving people information and going, do you agree with this team? Yes or no? And that's quite an awkward situation for somebody to be in. But if you pose everything as a question, you know, here's the background. What should we do about this? It encourages that discussion yeah. rather than, you know, you limiting your ideas to just the ones that have been presented. Now, that approach of asking, you know, going in with questions is a lovely way to think about it almost like a menu of the things that you want to do. That's really not a really nice approach. Right. I really, really like that. Mm -hmm. And I can see then how you that leads to a structure of you getting some useful things out of it, doesn't it? And if you're going into that, assuming you don't have the answers, really. Absolutely. It's kind of going with that curiosity. And, you know, those questions can even be sourced by speaking to everyone individually before. So, you, you know, you might have someone who is leading, you might have an external facilitator like, my, you know, myself or you, and that is kind of planning that offsite. And we may have individual conversations with everybody on the team to say, okay, you're going to be spending a day together. What do you think would be most important or most useful for you to discuss? And then using that um, to plan the outline. No, I really like that. That's a nice way to think about it as well. Because then you get some real structure around the offsite and you've got a clear idea of, 
actually what you're working towards and what the point of the offsite is rather than obviously getting people together and there's somehow magic that you're going to create off the back of it. So talk me through then what, what other things can kind of go wrong with offsites? What other things in your experience have you seen where these sorts of things have, have not gone to, to plan? What, what are the mistakes that a lot of people make? I think trying to do too much. Um, again, the article that I wrote recently, I just scoured through all the conversations that I've had with teams and the offsites that we've run at Bracket and realized that there are kind of three areas that you can use an offsite for. And this, you know, this can be at um, C-suite, but it can also be sort of other teams within an organization. Um, one of the top reasons that people say, you know, we want to have an offsite is because it's for the kind of team bonding. Um, and we, we want to build our team, that is great. But then if you're expecting business results out of that as a result, then you're going to fail because you haven't, again, specified team bonding is one thing um, and, you know, getting to know each other, maybe doing some kind of activity that is more social. Then there's might be um, a category which is around learning together. We want to learn new skills, understand a new topic that we haven't covered before together and then there's the um the creating together which is kind of like the traditional strategy development often when i speak to um leaders that want to run off sites they've kind of got all of those mixed up um in for we want to do an offsite and it's because we want to connect better as a team we want to learn this topic perhaps ai and we want to um, develop some new ideas for our next project together um all of those are fine to want to achieve if you've got the time that it's possible to talk through all of those things together. If not, if you've got half a day or a day, then you're going to have to make some choices about what you what is most important to do. And so I think that's the first thing, having sort of fuzzy goals. And if you have fuzzy goals and you don't really get the, the, the output. Um, I think the other thing as well is connected to the fuzzy goals, the, the misaligned expectations and thinking just by getting people together and having a conversation and even kind of, you know, having a focused strategy discussion, they will be changing the business afterwards. Uh, you know, I, even in my early days of facilitation, I kind of felt this as a facilitator, getting a team together, having a really great conversation and knowing this is sort of the concept behind my book, workshop culture, but knowing that even though the team had had a great day together, there needed to be more work for them to really see the results of that in the business. And that transition from having a really creative, engaging, ideas generating conversation to translating those ideas into things that are actually going to make a difference is actually quite difficult. You know, sometimes it's about resources. We need to get more resources to do this. Maybe we need to do more research. Sometimes it's a capacity or capability issue. You know, sometimes the things that people want to do as a team, you haven't actually got the skills in your team to be able to implement them. So there's a, sometimes a real big gap between the idea and the execution and whether people have the ability to, um, first of all, put them into place, but translate that is, an, is another thing. And that's where people can get disappointed by the results of offsites. That's interesting, isn't it? Because like you said, they have big expectations, right? That somehow, you know, two people are not getting on or two teams aren't getting along, stick them in a room together, they'll work it out. Plus coming up with a strategy, yeah. plus learning about all these things. There's, there's a huge expectation on that in such a short amount of time. And you're only going to be disappointed yeah. on the, all three of those things because you haven't got the time to do any of them in any depth. That's really interesting, isn't Absolutely. it? So sort of taking it a little bit more slowly and creating a bit of structure around those different elements. And I really like those three elements you talked about there, wasn't it? The the kind of idea of that's, was it alignment, learning and... Socialising, so learning and creating. Yeah, those yeah. three as well. It's just focusing, I suppose, time on each of them, if that's what you want to do, but being clear on which are the ones you're trying to do at any one point is going to really help you to make Absolutely. sure you get those goals off the end of it. Now, that's a really lovely way to think about it. And what about that then? So you mentioned sort of people often have quite high expectations around sites, workshops, these things as well. What about kind of white space around some of this stuff then because again you know you can pack that day full of stuff is that is it important to pack things and get everybody working all the time what's what about white space and other space around some of that stuff yeah absolutely i mean interesting because there's a bit of research that i refer to um i think it's called um off to plan or off to lunch and it's something about strategy workshops and it actually says it's, you know it talks about this challenge of 
you know, having a really intense day to focus on these things and the lack of follow up in the business. And it actually says that it's much better to do shorter strategy sessions over a, a longer period of time than try and do these kind of intense sessions together. I mean, the thing is, is the intensity feels good, doesn't it? And there is value to that intensity. But in terms of impact, actually, what we want to do is shift the behavior in our organizations to bring more strategic thinking in a more regular and consistent way rather than only once a year. Um, yeah, that's, I, I think that's, it's, there is something to, to the intensity, I, you know, the, the white space, the slack, I mean, when you're running a workshop, we can't work at full pelt all the time. Anyway, we do need to have some downtime, some time for individual thinking, the spaces in between. And I would also argue about, um, trying to do everything in that one day. And then thinking that that's enough, um, which is kind of, you know, a, a nice segue if you're, if you want to take it in this direction, sort of the concept behind workshop culture, which is that, you know, there's a reason why we hold those offsites because we want collaboration and creativity. People think differently, but we need that in our organizations every single day. So how do we make that more of a regular behavior? And that makes sense as well, because again, we we would love it to be just one hit, right? We'll do two, three, three days a year. We'll fix collaboration. We'll do strategy, and it's done till next year. But what you're saying is, and I think we've probably all experienced this: is the offsite's great, but then you're back to work again on the Monday, and everything's kind of as it was. There's no sort of real change other than it was good. And so, how do you do that then? How do you kind of follow an offsite with something that's going to stick or last? What do you sort of? How do you do that? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's as simple as a conversation about this. Um, you know, again, when we don't think about the barriers to translating some of these ideas into action, we miss out on some of the, um, how challenging it can be. Sometimes, as I mentioned, in order to put an idea, to make an idea happen, we need to learn new skills. And so even just having a conversation about that, okay, this is an idea we have. What is it going to take to see the results in the business? What are the steps that we need to take? You know, do we need to learn new skills? Do we need to get some extra expertise in and really mapping it out? Even down to, you know, some of this is about behavior change. Some of this is about individuals developing, you know, particularly when it's, it comes down to how the teams work together. Um, there, there are going to be new habits that people need to develop. Um, you might have a a C-suite team that want to communicate more effectively and they want to share information across their teams um, more effectively. Well, that's going to need to, you're going to need to do something different. Maybe it's, you might bring in a new tool, but the tool is only one side of it. The next part is actually using the tool. And that's the, that's the tension. That's the barrier, not the, the buying the tool is easy, but the actually using it is the, is the challenge when you haven't done it before. I like that. So you kind of have to frame the offsite as not something that just is two or three days away somewhere, right? It's got to be a longer lasting. And you, I like the way you talked about it early on as being a project, right? The project doesn't end on that Friday when everybody jumps mm. on the plane and goes home again, right? It's got to be a lasting yeah. set of changes that come into that, right? So that's follow-ups, isn't it? That's mm -hmm. things that you're following up from in terms of individual. Right. Um, you talked about some of the purposes and some of the objectives of what you're trying to do, following all of that up. But also not just, mm -hmm. I like the way you talked about it as well, not just the strategy or the high level, hey, we're going to do this kind of stuff, but also the resourcing conversations beneath that, that mean that that can actually really happen. So following it up in a very Brilliant. structured way. Now, would, would you suggest, what would be the best way to kind of do that, right? Because everybody's focused on the two or three days, logistics for that, mm. everything's there, right? What about effort focusing on that longer tail afterwards? What kind of, how much effort should they put into the after the? off-site as they put into the off-site itself? I think just as much. Um, I always kind of say that when you're designing any kind of workshop, in fact, that you should be thinking about the follow-up as you're designing it. Um, so you're almost like designing what that follow-up looks like as you're structuring, structuring the workshop. Ideally, I mean, this is always very difficult to do, but spending a good chunk of time on this implementation aspect. Often we get to the end of workshops. I mean, this happens in my workshops. I'm not always perfect at this, but we have a really great discussion when we get to all the 10 minutes at the end and it's like, okay, what are our actions? Um, and actually one of extends that conversation, you know, some of the best offsites that I have run have been where we've spent, you know, two, sometimes three hours on that 
these are the commitments, these are the actions. Now let's talk about what are the barriers, like what do we need to put in place to make it happen? And actually almost again, design um, that into the conversation. So you're um, collaborating on what you're going to do afterwards to make sure that all of these things fall into place. I mean, that, that's a nice way to think about it. So as much time on the planning the offsite as you are planning the follow-ups to that as well. And your, yeah. your point's right. We, I've been on so many workshops and offsites where the, you know, the last 10 minutes of Friday has next steps. You've got 10 minutes and everybody just wants to get out of there at that point. So you're never really focusing yeah. on what those next steps are, ownership of those, you know, who's taking those away, the follow-up, because you just, you know, you just, you think you're done because you've come up with the vision or the strategy. And the reality is, is you need those follow-ups to make sure that happens, not, you know, that's half the, half, half of the job is done when you've got the strategy. The other half then is the implementation of that off the back of it. It's a really nice Absolutely. way to think about it, right? Half and half. Yeah, great. Um, so what, what are other, some, um, some other tips then? So, you, you, you know, you do a lot of facilitating of offsites and things like that as well. What are some of the tips for, I mean, who should, who should be the, doing the facilitating in the team? What, how does that kind of side of it work? Who's, who should be the person up mm. there kind of leading this stuff? You know, say an offsite or a workshop. Yeah, I mean, ideally, the person that should be leading the workshop or facilitating the workshop is someone who doesn't have like skin in the game, um, because it can be very difficult to play that part of the um, facilitator who's guiding the discussion and guiding the process, and someone who's contributing to the content. Um, ideally, you would have someone. I mean, it doesn't have to be an external facilitator; it could be someone from another team that has got these skills. But someone who is external to the people doing the work, I would, I would suggest. At the same time, I mean, with these kind of big offsites, that's what I recommend. At the same time, you know, the concept behind um, workshop culture is, is that we're bringing these, this way of working um, and these tools into our work every day. In which case, it's not always possible to bring in an external facilitator. And what we want is to bring those skills into the team. So it is the leader that sets up the space for those conversations to happen. But yeah, everybody has kind of a, an ability to facilitate if they need to. There's another um, research paper um, that I, I can give you these and you practically put, put them in the notes, but there's one um, on, it's called, um, the concept is called ideational CEO facilitation. And there's some research that shows that the CEOs um, that are um, get the best results of their top management teams are the ones that have facilitation skills. That's really um, interesting. It's by mm -hmm. a researcher called Paul pa Paulus and um, A. Carmelli, and I'll I'll send you the link the link to it. But it shows that you know the, the successful organisations are the ones where you have individuals that are skilled in bringing people together and having those productive conversations, which. You know, it makes sense that we intuitively, we know this. This is the reason we have companies because we need groups of people to do things together. And so it would make sense that within those companies, we have the ability to ensure that that happens. Um, and in reality, we know that that doesn't always, that doesn't always happen in the most productive way. It's a really nice way to think about it, isn't it really? So again, if you think about purely offsite as well, the money you're spending on getting everybody in that room mm. as well having a facilitator in to get the most from those people. You know, if you look at it from a purely financial point of view, it's kind of, is, no, is a no brainer anyway, isn't it really to do that because of the cost and actually the importance of what you're putting the effort into. Or at the very least, whoever that facilitator is, has the skills to be able to do that properly rather than somebody who is volunteering, yeah. right? It's got to be somebody who's got the appropriate skills to be able to do that and to lead that properly anyway. That's interesting, Absolutely. isn't it? And I think what's interesting there, I also take a pick up on that point as well is, the skill set for a facilitator is is again different, you know, different set of skills for a for a leader than perhaps yeah. they're used to as well. So talk me through that. How do you how do you get better at facilitating? Yeah. Where's the sort of place to start with some of that? So if you want to be that facilitator who's that great leader CEO, how do you kind of get started? Yeah, so I think there's there's skills and there's mindset. Um and the mindset shift is largely I don't need to be the one with all the answers. Because, you know, often, again, through no fault, it's just the way that it is. Leaders are promoted into positions because of their knowledge, their experience, their skill set. Um, and when you then move into that position, it's not just about you sharing what you know. It's about 
creating an environment for everybody on your team to share what they know. Um, and that transition can be quite difficult to make. And so with that, I say start with getting good at asking great questions, like being genuinely curious. If you can, I guess there's a humility to it. And actually I did a session this morning where I referenced the book Humble Inquiry by Edgar Schein. And that's a really great book to read. Um, you know, the book talks all about the value of asking questions and um, taking that curious approach in business and what it can do not only for business results, but for relationships as well. So I would start there asking really great questions, like getting better, asking questions, even if it's, you know, just take something small that you feel um, you don't feel vulnerable around and take it to a meeting. I've got this challenge coming up. What do you think? And putting it out to your team and then asking questions around that. And then, you know, twinned with asking great questions is also listening. You can't just ask questions and then kind of not actually um, yeah. take into mind what people say. So you have to, you know, cultivate those those listening skills. Um, and there are, you know, we all know sort of the, the term active listening and what that means, like, you know, not um, listening to respond, but listening to understand, giving people space, asking questions that enable people to go deeper and reflect. Um, so, yeah, so I'd start with, with, with those two as a, you know, as a base level. And then I'll talk about sort of two other skills, which is, um, again, I think this is kind of a bit more of a mindset, but being prepared that when you ask those genuine questions and you listen intently, the responses that come back may be what you not, but may not be what you expect. Um, and that's part of it, kind of letting go of that certainty, um, letting go of control in a sense, and being genuinely curious to hear what people think. Um, and with that, that does bring a level of discomfort, right? Because, you know, leaders have got so much on their, they've got so much on their shoulders. Um, and when you start to sort of bring that more collaborative environment into your team, you're gonna, you have to let go of a bit of that control. And um, so it brings a little bit of kind of uncertainty, a little bit of un uncomfortable, you know, discomfort. I always kind of also refer to this as like in a workshop environment, if you do ask questions, um, wait for people to respond and you create that environment where everyone can speak up, you can also feel a little bit chaotic. And, you know, in the business world, we, we kind of don't like chaos. We like everything to be kind of tidy and clean and, you know, logical in a, in, you know, a nice kind of easy sequence and a workshop kind of, an effective workshop will blow all of that out of the water. So you have to kind of get comfortable with that. Um, but you get food to the other end and then you're, you know, as an objective, someone who's outside of the content, you're able to spot those connections, bring things together. So I kind of look at this cycle of asking questions, listening, dealing with what comes up, which might be a bit messy and a bit chaotic, and then somehow bringing it together into something that you can move forward with. It's almost like that divergent, convergent yeah. thinking and um, model. It's, it's a really lovely way to think about it, actually. It's a lot of work I do with the CEOs that I coach is both of those things, because mm. You're right, you get promoted to that point as a leader, often because you're an expert. You, you're used to having the answers, right? That's been your superpower. And, and that can count against you in leadership because you, you, know, you probably don't anymore. There are people who know a lot more about you, a lot more than you who are out there. And that's great. Those are the people you want to hire. And so it's very tempting to be that person because that's that you well in your career. So one of the exercises I set some of my CEOs to help them get over that discomfort is, 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 not to, ask, is, is to only ask questions. If they're giving an answer, mm. they lose a point. For every question they ask, they yeah. get two points. At the end of the week, we give them right. a tally score. Because again, it's just a muscle that you need to build up. And the more you get used to that, Absolutely. who knows what you're going to learn and where that's going to take you in terms of the future of your business, because you can't know everything. Because again, it's just you. Absolutely. That's how you leverage a team at the end of the day. Thank you so much for your time today. Alison, I've learned, it's been great. I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Really, thank you Matt, very much. Um, Great questions. Thank you. Where, where can um, where can people learn more about you? Where where should they go to learn more about you? Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, so I'm Alison Coward on LinkedIn. Um, my website bracket is actually um, bracketcreative.co.uk, and you can also um, you know search for my book Workshop Culture. Um, I should be the first person that comes up if you type up Workshop Culture and link to various places to to find out more about that as well great and you mentioned your newsletter as well didn't you as well that sounds like it's something that's interesting as well is that your bracket creative as well 
Yeah, That's exactly. You can sign well. up. You can sort of hit the website. Yeah. Great. Yeah, you can find the link to sign up to that. Great. Thanks again for your time. Thank you.